All right, all right, student. Um, so today I'm going to record the note for a result of natural selection. Last time we talked about natural selection. Today we're going to talk about what is the result, what is the ending effect of natural selection, right? We talk about nature, right? Who decide who's going to live in according to natural selection again? Nature, right? So you got to fit in. You got to learn to fit in. If you don't, then nature will um, not select you and you cannot pass on your gene to the next generation. Result of natural selection speciation. So really quick, um, we did the um, um, the pepper moth situation, uh, uh, simulation, right? We said that if the environment changed, in this case, the forest, right? It went from naturally it was uh, light and then the dark moth genetically they was not chosen by nature so they will can be easily hunted by the hawk but then when the environment change the forest change to dark then suddenly the darker one fit in better so the lighter one need to figure out a way to survive or else they'll be eliminated right and then if you uh, go back to those forests in England again, now they actually convert to light again. So the light, lighter moth are coming back. Um, so nature, uh, natural selection technically forced those lacking the trait and let them live in some situation die. What does it mean? That means in some situation, that trait is favorable. So they live. But when they move to a different situation, that tree might not fit in and they die. Okay. For example, uh, how do you apply this to your life? If you're a student, for example, right, you might fit in in a classroom, a one a certain teacher very well. But if you move on to another classroom and you don't know how to uh, fit in that new classroom setting, then you might struggle. So natural selection said you got to be the one that try to fit in struggle uh, to survive. If you just sit there and expect things to happen for you, then you might be eliminated, right? And that's what natural selection. Um, today we're going to focus on there are, nature can decide three ways, three different ways. The first way is what we call stabilizing selection. Stabilizing selection means it's stable. That means it's the norm, right? Norm. So I want to go over the graph really quick. This is when there is no selection at all. In every population, in this case, the beetle, let's say we focus on colors. You always have the norm in the middle, right? Yeah, it makes sense, right? The lighter, somewhere in between in the middle. And then you have the extreme. Very, very light. Very, very dark on the side, right? This is no selection. In a stabilizing selection, those that are extreme, the extreme here, they are eliminated. That means they get killed off. So that means this population of beetle color will slowly become this color, right? Now apply it to human height, for example. If nature decides to eliminate the extreme and go through stabilizing selection, then the shortest and the tallest are eliminated. And slowly, human will have like the average height. Okay. And that's what we call stabilizing selection. Right. Make sure you know that. So for your um, Kahoot. And then the next selection we're going to talk about is called directional selection. In this selection, the extreme of one side is eliminated. For example, let's say nature decide to get rid of the really light color, right? That means slowly the color of the beetle will become darker and darker because the lighter one are being eliminated. So slowly they hit one direction. Let's say in height, let's say nature decides to eliminate the very, very short people. Slowly human gonna become taller and taller. Let's say nature decides to eliminate the very, very tall people. Slowly over years, human population become shorter and shorter. So that's what directional selection is. And the last selection is what we call disruptive selection. That means something is wrong in the middle. 
the one in the middle is eliminated, right? The norm is eliminated. Now, suddenly you have two types of species, two types of beetle, the very light and the very dark. And disruptive selection is what often lead to speciation, right? For example, human, all the people in the middle height are eliminated. Nature prefer only the very short or the very tall. So that means suddenly you're gonna have a group of human that are very short, they hang out with each other, tall hang out with each other, and slowly they so far away from each other, they lead to what we call as speciation. And this is what we call the <clears throat> um, macro evolution. It takes years. Micro evolution is like the pepper moth simulation. It's very short time to see the difference. Macro take thousands, hundreds, millions of years to see the difference, like human evolution. It's considered macro evolution. Um, okay. So anyway, when you have disruptive selection, this is where you suddenly have speciation. Speciation means you evolve new species. For example, you start out from one and then slowly they be so different, so they become different species, speciation. Speciation can be caused by two isolation, two ways. One is what we call geographic isolation. Geographic has to do with earth. That means when the species are too far away from each other to interact or have sex and have offspring, that they become so different. An example would be over here. Let's say you have beetle and then suddenly you have a geographic isolation like a river split the population up or like a mountain, forest, city. So now suddenly these beetles, they don't get to interact with each other. Over a year, they become so different. And then when the river is gone or that geographic isolation is removed, they're so different. They don't, they don't hang out with each other. And then there's also what we call reproductive isolation. That means their sex organ change. They're so different, they don't fit. It's kind of like bees feeding them different food. When they eat different food, their body develops differently. And when you put them together, they don't interact with each other. They interact with, with themselves only, but not with other different species. And these are the two ways that lead to speciation, different species. And think of how humans have evolved as well, right? If you believe in evolution. Um, so this is another example of geographic isolation, right? These owl, spot owl used to be together. But now you have two species, one is Norn and one is Mexican spot owl. And what do you think is the reason why they are not together? Right? Look, there's a geographic isolation here. And that's because maybe city, right? You have buildings, urban city, split them up. And over time, they're so different. And when you put them together, they do not mate with each other. Okay? There's another type of geographic isolation, what we call temporal isolation. That has to do with season, right? This frog might reproduce best around this time. This frog might reproduce best around that time. And since they both reproduce different season, they don't interact with each other. It's kind of like bears, right? Most bears hibernate during the winter. So let's say you have a species of bear that hibernate in the summer. I mean, that hibernate in the summer instead of winter, now they don't fit the same season. And that's what we call temporal. Temporal has to do with time. Okay. Um, then reproductive isolation would be, you know, their sex organs, uh, mutation in, in by chance, made it too different, so they don't fit. So my next question is, speaking of species, let's say you see two types of owl. How do you know they're different species? Well, all these scientists came together and they have established like a requirement. First is they have to be the same organism, like cat with cat, dog with dog, right? Can be cat with cow. Right? They have to live in the same location. Can't be one in the ocean and one on land. They have to live in the same time. That means same time frame. You can't have dinosaur, same species as alligator because they live different time frame. And the last thing is they have to be able to reproduce with each other. And then their kid would then go on and have their own kid. Very important. 
if their kid cannot have their own kid, they do not, they are not the same species. And they have to meet all these requirements. Okay, let's test yourself out. Next question. Are these dog a poodle and a schnauzer? Poodle, schnauzer, there's something wrong with here. Are they same species, right? They are dogs. They live the same time frame. They come together, they reproduce. And they make a snoodle. You can't see it, but a snoodle. A snoodle can then go on and produce more snoodle baby. So yes, these two dogs are the same species. Moving on. How about a horse and a mule? Horse and a donkey, I meant. A horse, donkey, look alike, live the same time. Can they have baby with each other? Yeah. Their baby is called what we call a mule. But are they the same species? Actually, no. They are not the same species. How come? And that's because a mule cannot go on and reproduce their own baby. So every time you want a mule, you got to take a horse mixed with a donkey to get a mule. You cannot have a mule go with a mule to make more mule. Okay. So that's why horse and donkey are not the same species, even though they met the other requirement. So throughout the year, you might have, you have species that have evolved, changed, okay, or speciation. Now moving on to the next note, our next part is, can speciation be stopped? Can evolution of speciation be stopped? Can things stay normal instead of change over time? The question is, the answer is yes. This is what we call a Hardy-Weinberg principle. It was in your vocab list. A Hardy-Weinberg principle is where all these scientists came together and said yes. It is possible if we, for us to stop them from changing. Let's say human, we love the way we are. We don't want to change in a million years. We want to stay the same form, same feature. Yes, you can, but it will not occur unless you meet these requirements. First thing is once you, nothing change, this is what we call genetic equilibrium. Equilibrium means eco, right? Everything stay the same. No allele change, no gene change. So what are the requirements to stop speciation or evolution? First, you need to have random mating. No mutation, like no random change. You gotta live in a large population. No migration, everybody stay the same. And of course, no natural selection. I mean, nature cannot decide. So now look at this, is it possible? It's almost impossible, right? Almost impossible. But yes, if you're able to meet these requirements, then everything stays the same. But we know that's not, technically that's not possible because nature decides what's going on, right? Maybe in a smaller frame, like in a glass dorm, you can control these things, but not in nature, right? So yes, possible, but it's almost impossible to do it. Let's talk about a little bit of each Random mating. Random mating is when you close your eye and you randomly pick a partner. This way it allow everything, all the traits are equally chosen. Is, does human do random mating? No, right? We, we pick, we choose, we choose somebody with the trait that we like. For example, we like somebody who's tall. Then we choose somebody who's tall. And let's say everybody likes somebody who's tall, then suddenly, you will have speciation. You will have people become taller and taller. So you, if you want to keep everything the same, no change, then you have to promote random mating. Have everybody randomly pair up, right? But we know that this is not possible, right? In human, maybe in a small test. And then no mutation. Can you control mutation? If you don't want things to change, you make sure everybody stay, look the same, stay the same. And we know that's not possible because mutation is a random chain in gene. So yes, is in a small environment, you can. And the next thing is if you want everything to stay the same, you make sure that things are happen in a large population. What do I mean by large population? A large population would be everybody have a chance to somebody. So that way things are evenly stay the same. What happens if you live in a small population? If you live in a small population, it will lead to what we call genetic drift. 
Genetic drift means that gene will disappear for some reason. Let's say you live in a small population. Let's say the only person who's tall, just one person is tall in that population. What happened? That person accidentally or something happened to disappear. Then what happened to the tall gene? It has genetically drift away. Then that's not good because then everybody will be focused on the small people. Then the population will slowly change to small. So small population will lead to speciation. So you have to make sure you're in a large population. That means even if one tall guy disappears, there's still many other tall people, right? And that's why it leaves what we call genetic drift. So I use an example would be, uh, they live such a small population that they might be cousin and they marry each other. And all the genes that make them different will disappear because now they all carry, the kid will might carry the same gene of their family. Over time, all the kid will be kind of like their family. And I mean, slowly everybody become like their family, what we call speciation. And then the last thing is migration. You want to make sure things are not moving in or moving out. In nature, that's not possible, right? But in maybe in a small test, you can, right? If you don't want everybody to, to change, then you allow, you keep only those people in one place. Don't let some new gene come in, right? Same place. Then that way it will stay the same. But unfortunately in nature, people or organism move in and out. So it changed the gene pool. So in the end, it is almost impossible, right? To maintain this, to stop evolution or to stop speciation. It will happen, right? Because nature changed. And for us to survive fit in, we need to change. And we know that our global climate change is changing. So for human to continue to survive, we need to change. I want to go over what we call bottleneck population because it's in your vocab list. Bottleneck can also lead to speciation. What is a bottleneck population? A bottleneck population like this, it's kind of literally like a bottle. Let's say you have all these human population. Everybody live happily here. Suddenly there's a disaster. It wipe out almost everybody. Only a few people can escape. Only a few people. So what happened to, to this species? Do we have a variety of trait now? No, right? Because only a few people, remember what happened to small population? When you have only a few people survive, then suddenly that population head toward those few people. And it's what we call a bottleneck population. And that will lead to speciation as well. So how do humans fit into this theory? Well, we know that we are not recommended to stay in small population, right? We don't all want to be all look the same. We want to be diverse. The more diverse you are, the higher chance that you will have the skill, the trait to fit in that changing environment, right? So to increase your chance of survival because global climate change, we need to be diverse. Instead of locking a cell, instead of building a wall and keep everybody in, we need to be diverse. And that's what didn't work out with Adolf Hitler, right? He wants everybody to be the same. And we know that nature does not support that. Nature wants things to be different. We want to have speciation. So that way we might not be able to survive, but our kid will be able to survive because they have all the good skill. All right, so I'll leave it there for the note. So make sure you um, do the summary. All right, enjoy the note. Bye-bye.